first, I have a little bit of a game. So I have some images to show up on the screen to show differences in the generations. Can we get the first image up there? Okay, so how many of you guys know what this is? Does anyone know what this is? I see some hands. What, what is it? It's a high beam for, uh, for the older cars. My grandfather had a 1972 uh, Ford F-150. It was bright green. It was awesome. Well, that's the reason why I know this one. Okay, so what about the next one? How many of you guys know what this is? It's a showing, sewing machine. Okay, we don't really use that very much anymore, right? Uh, not many people are, are gifted in the skill of sewing. Okay, what about the next one? How many of you know what this is? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see Catalina knows what it is. Yeah, this is a, a cassette tape. And you, if you know, you know that the pencil uses to wind it back up. Yeah, yeah. Good old days and VHSs too. Now we have all digital. Okay, what about the next one? What is this? Ice, ice cream. cube. Okay, so we're getting more and more familiar. Okay, the next one. What is this? It's a French press. I hear it over here, a French press. So I wanted something to represent my generation, the millennial generation. What better to represent us than fancy coffee? A French press is like, it takes an hour to make a cup of coffee, but you get it. Okay, what about the last one? I ah, hear it over here. <laughs> yeah, with those. What is it? No, TikTok. I didn't even TikTok. Know. Does anyone know what TikTok is? It's the, it's the social media of, uh, of Gen Z, of this next generation. It's like their version of Facebook. Uh, so we see even with that, there's a little bit of a difference in generations. We see that the kids out here aren't going to know what a high uh, You might not know what TikTok is. You see, there's a difference, and there is this division between generations. It's a natural division, just like there's a difference between men and women, just like there's a difference between different ethnicities, between uh, even the Latino cultures. We have Puerto Ricans here. We have Cubans here. We have Haitians here. There's a differences in those cultures, right, just like there is in the generational culture. But the one thing that is not true is that, th that those differences are divisive in the church. You see, in the church, it's supposed to be unified. Those generational uh, differences are supposed to bring us together. So that's what we're going to talk about today is the role of every generation in the church, how to truly be a multi-generational church. So I want to begin by reading a passage from Proverbs. Um, uh, you guys might know this. You might not. It's Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29. It says, the glory of young men is in their strength, but the splendor of old men is their gray hair. You see, every generation, every single person has something to offer. In this passage of Proverbs, right, truisms, we're saying that uh, this is a, a generational truth that the young people have their strength, but the older people have their wisdom of their gray hair. You see, we need each other. So actually today, uh, it's not just going to be young Chase up here teaching. It's actually going to be me and Pastor Brian, because what better way to emphasize a multi-generational uh, 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 teaching than to have multiple multiple generations up. So if you guys could welcome Pastor Brian up. All right. Good morning. Again, good morning. So first of all, I want to say this. Chase is doing an absolutely fantastic job in uh, ministering to uh, our children and our young adults as well. And so we've actually just this week changed his title from uh, children and youth director to the next gen director at Hollywood Community Church because he is the director of the next generation. So uh, I want to put all of this in biblical perspective and we want to have as much of a conversation today as we want to have a message for you today. So I want to read just a few verses from Mark chapter 10 and they're going to put those up on the screen. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10. If not, we'll put them uh, up on the screen. But let me ask you this. So as we get older, it may, it's a little bit more difficult. And so I'm speaking to my generation today. If you're my generation or older, sometimes it gets a little bit more difficult the older we get to be around children. Is that not true? So uh, I love my grandkids. I have five grandkids, four granddaughters, and one grandson. I love being around them, 
but after a couple of days, they wear me out. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so, so they were at our house for a bit, and so um, we put them on a plane on Friday, and it's hard for me to, to say goodbye to them, but whenever they leave, it's kind of like, okay, we can breathe a little bit. There were actually times that when they were there, I would go in the room and shut the door just for a few minutes of peace and quiet, all right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. We get on an airplane, and we see kids at the front part of the plane, and where do we want to sit? As far away the as possible. The back part of the plane. Mm -hmm. Or we go in a restaurant, and the waiter or waitress wants to put us at a table right beside a whole big family with kids, and our response is, can you put me at a table on the other side of the restaurant? <laughs> we, we love kids. At times, it's difficult for us to be around them, though. Catch my point. If we're not careful, we do that in the church as well. Yep. We view children's ministry and we view youth ministry as something we do. Let's put the kids in the other side of the building. Let's hire a next-gen director who's going to teach them God's word. But we think that the important stuff that's happening is happening right in here. And as long as the kids are isolated and away from us, then we can enjoy worship together as a church family. So we're not the first people to think that way. Let me read a passage of scripture to you and so, show you that the Lord dealt with this mindset during his time as well. So in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 13, it says this, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. Now that might seem in our modern-day vernacular, that might seem a little odd, but, but the tradition in New Testament times was that families would bring their children to well-known rabbis, to well-known teachers, for the purpose of those rabbis blessing or touching their children. So, so here's Jesus, he's out teaching, and while he's teaching and healing and doing all of these things, parents are bringing their kids to Jesus because they want Jesus to bless them. They want Jesus to touch them. But the disciples, the text says, rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. We all know what the word indignant means? He was mad. Jesus was upset. And he rebukes the disciples and he tells them, let the children come to me. Don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God of God. Then he makes this profound statement. He says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took those children in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Would you pause? Let's just have a word of prayer this today. So asking the Holy Spirit of God for us to understand what was taking place in this story, but more importantly, that it might speak to us. Father, we thank you today that children are important to Jesus. Thank you that these boys and girls that stood before us today, they're important to you. Help us to understand that, and may children and youth and young adults be important to us as a church family as well. Give us a burden to have a multi-generational church at Hollywood Community Church and help us to learn what that means and how we should do that. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. So if you have your outline, let me just walk, I know some of you are outline people, let me just walk through a few points from your outline. The first is this, children and youth are important to God. Yes, they're important to God. It would have been completely understandable for someone as busy as Jesus to not have wanted to be disturbed by children. After all, Jesus had a lot to do, right? He had people to heal. He had sermons to preach. He had disciples to train. He had relationships to build. I mean, very honestly, Jesus could have been so important. His response could have been, disciples, please do me a favor and keep those children away from me. I've got to do the work that God has called me to do. 
quite frankly, that is not how Jesus responded. As a matter of fact, the text indicates, if you study the text, the text indicates that not only did Jesus receive children, but that children were drawn to Jesus. Here's the way I wrote it in my notes. The children were drawn to Jesus because of his tender love and his compassion for them. In verse 14, he says, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for of such is the kingdom of God. I'd venture to say that if Jesus was corporately here with us today, I mean, if all of a sudden we could say, hey, put your hands together, we're so glad to have Jesus with us today. And by the way, I would say he is here with us, we just can't see him. But if Jesus was corporately here present, I'm convinced that he would be surrounded not only by adults who would want to converse with him, but he would be surrounded by children. I agree, Pastor. And children and youth, because they're important to him. Throughout the New Testament, we find Jesus loving and caring for children. Matthew chapter 15, he heals the daughter of a Gentile woman. In Mark chapter 5, he raises a child from the dead. In John chapter 6, he actually borrows six little fish or little fish and, and, and bread from a little child. Over and over and over again in the New Testament, we find Jesus loving, caring for, and ministering to children. When I was a little child, I learned this song. You could sing it with me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. What does the Bible teach us? The Bible teaches us that children are important to God. We sang this one as well. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black, black and white, they are all what? Precious, Precious in, his sight. in his sight. But catch this, if Jesus' love for the children was expected, we would expect Jesus to respond that way. The response of the disciples was unexpected. Because while Jesus was touching and ministering the disciples, here are the disciples over in a corner, and they're agitated. <laughs> They're upset, so much so that all of a sudden they start going to these parents who are bringing their kids to Jesus, telling them, don't bother him. Leave him alone. He's got important things to do. He's preaching. He is teaching. I can just hear the disciples saying, come on now. Jesus is a busy man. Leave him alone. He cannot be bothered by children. I'm sure their motives were sincere. Here's the way I wrote it in my notes if you have your outline. The disciples were protecting Jesus because they did not understand how important children, and I would say youth, were to him. In other words, here's a modern day translation of what Jesus is saying. He says, let them come. Don't stop them. Don't hinder them. Okay, so church, here's where I want to get really practical. It's easy for us to read this story and be a little critical of the disciples, is it not? Mm-hmm. Kind of put our hands on our hips and think, those disciples, they just didn't get it, did they? They just didn't get it. But if we're not careful, we act and respond the exact same way. If we're not careful, even in our good intentions, we hinder children from coming to Jesus. We do that as parents, and we do that as leaders in the church. Sometimes it's by our attitude. We don't want to be bothered by them. We don't want to be disturbed by them. We would love a service where all the kids are somewhere else, and we're in here, and we can have an adult service. If we're not careful. We hinder just the way that Jesus did. Chase, How do we do that? Why don't you talk for a few minutes about how we, as parents, and how we, as as a church, hinder children from coming to Jesus? Well, I think there are a few different ways that we can hinder uh, the church uh, from the children and the church from coming to Jesus. Uh, But something as simple as they're wiggling around, they're talking. Okay, even right now, children are moving around. It's okay. Let them come to Jesus. That's just a little bit of free. It's not in the notes. That's just what I'm noticing right now. 
So I think the first way we hinder children is we hinder them with our lack of consistency. Now, I'm going to use a lot of scripture today, and the reason why I'm going to use a lot of scripture is because I think that God is very scripture that loves the children. Yeah, is my mic going in and out? Let's I'll use this I, one right here. Yeah, let's or use this one down here, Jason. You can get this one. Use this one. Let's use another one. We'll get this worked out. Let me turn this one off so you're not hearing me double. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, much better. There we go. I can even hear myself better. Yeah, I don't like this one then. Um, so I think we hinder them by our lack of consistency. We're going to use a lot of scripture today, so bear with me. Um, but again, it's because that God is very clear throughout all of scripture that he loves children. He speaks very clearly about what he wants us to do with children. So the first passage I want to talk about is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Now this should be a familiar passage for some of you guys. Uh, those of us from a Jewish context, it's called the Shema, the o, Hear, O Israel. It's actually said every single uh, Saturday service. Um, so it's very familiar. Now this is God speaking. So he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and you, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, God is saying that, you need to do it as you go. You see, here in scripture we see that parents are the number one discipler of children. They are the number one discipler of the children in the home. Discipleship falls on the parents. I can't say it enough. It is not the church's main responsibility. You see, parents are supposed to teach their children as they walk, as they talk, as they lie down, read them bedtime stories. But you see, parents are broken just like everyone else. And so that's where the church steps in. That's where I step in. That's where it begins to be our job, my job and your job, to disciple the children. You see, we hinder uh, the, the children with our lack of consistency. We need to be more consistent in the home and in the church. Hey, we Chase, can I jump in there for absolutely. a second? So. We're bouncing back and forth here today. So let me give you an example of that, give you a live example of that. So, so I'm thrilled this morning to have my mom and dad right down on the front row. Mom and dad, would you kind of wave to everybody here? So my mom and dad down on the front row. So uh, many of you know that I'm a pastor. My brother is a pastor. My two sons are pastors. And my nephew, my brother's son, is a pastor. And people ask us all the time, so where did your dad pastor? They just assume it was like the family business, you know, that we just kind of pass it on from one to another. My dad wasn't a pastor. My dad was a barber. And then after that, he worked at Ashland Oil. And people ask, well, how is it that so many pastors came from your home? And, and, and here's the answer. Because of the consistency of my parents. Who, who, who lived what they taught. I would wake up in the morning and I would see my mom and dad with their Bibles praying. We were in church every single Sunday. I didn't always like that, but we were in church every single Sunday. We went to church whether we wanted to or not. I don't know how many times it was like, oh, can't we stay home today? No, we're going to church. We're going to church. And I am who I am today by the grace of God, by the gospel but because of parents who lived a consistent life in front of me. So I would submit to you today that we hinder our kids at times, not intentionally, but we hinder them in their spiritual growth because of our lack of consistency. The most important thing that you can do as a mom and dad is to be consistent with your kids. For them to see Jesus through you. Not only for them to hear you say it, but for them to see you live it. You see, Chris. Pastor and I come from very different backgrounds. He comes from a family that, that taught him. See, I didn't. My, my family, my parents are not believers today. So 
That's where the church steps in. That's where I went to a church and I began to have spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. I began to have these people who discipled me, even though they weren't my biological family, even though they weren't my, uh, the people that I was with every single day, the people who fed me, the people who clothed me, the people who uh, put a house over me. You see, this is where we step in. You see, even if you're not a parent today, you still have a responsibility. If you are a parent, then it is your responsibility to disciple your children. If you're a grandparent, it's your responsibility to disciple your children and your grandchildren. But if you're not, this is still applicable to you. You become spiritual parents, or in my case, spiritual brothers. A lot of my youth students view me as their big brother. I'm not their father. I'm their big brother. It's my job to disciple them, and it's your job to disciple them as well. I think another way that we hinder our children is by our lack of concern. You see, we don't consider um, uh, this age range to be very important. It's like, oh, well, they'll grow out of it. Uh, they might be rebellious now. Let them, let them live their life now, and when they become adults, they'll m- mature, and then they'll come to faith. Like, let them, let them get it out of their system. But you see, that's not what Scripture says. You see, we read the, uh, the verse earlier during the child dedication. We're going to read it again. Pro- Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. This is also a familiar passage for many of you guys. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You see, as Pastor said earlier, this is a truism, which means that it's generally true. It's wisdom. When you train up a child in the way that he should go, when he is old, he will not depart from it. You see, it begins now. Not when they're, not when they're 40 years old. Not when they're 60 years old. Not when they get it out of their system. But it should be our concern now. I think finally, our last way that we hinder them is by our lack of prayer. You see, um, we often view them as second-class citizens in the church. Oh, they're just children. They're young. They don't get it. But you see, that's not how Scripture sees them. Um, This is uh, uh, one of the last verses I'll have you guys turn to. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And it says, Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. You see, if, if it's a child today and they are, they are a believer, they are just as much a saint as anyone else in the sanctuary. As anyone else in this auditorium. You see, if you're 60 years old and you're a believer in Jesus today, you are just as much of a saint as the four-year-old that believes in Jesus. You're just as much of a saint as the 16-year-old who believes in Jesus. Or the 40-year-old who believes in Jesus. Or the 50-year-old. Put any age there and you are a saint. Make prayer and supplication for all the saints. We need to pray for this next generation. We see that they encounter so many challenges that maybe I didn't even encounter when I was growing up. A lot of different things that are going on in this world, this transition. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for them. And when we pray, it changes our hearts for them. No longer are we viewing them as, wow, I can't believe this generation is doing this. But we get God's heart for them. We, we develop God's compassion for them. You see, Pastor read the, the chapter in Mark. It said that when Jesus saw them, he, he felt compassion, right? He, he was drawn to them. He loved them. When we pray, we begin to feel like Jesus did towards our children. Not as annoyances, not as like in, um, uh, in the restaurant when all the babies are dropping food and, uh, and everything and screaming and, and I want my macaroni and cheese now. Um, and, but we see them as God sees them, as fellow heirs to the kingdom. So that, that, I think that's how we hinder them. But I think we need to transition into talking about how children are the current and next generation of HBC. You see, not only I'm the director of the next gen uh, ministries here at HBC, but often when we use that next generation terminology, it's like, oh, well, eventually they'll get in, in charge. Eventually they're going to uh, have uh, uh, value. No, they're the current generation too. Again, they are full saints with you. They have full value within the church. And so how do we do that? What do we do towards them? How do we view them as full members? I think we have to recognize that first, it is our responsibility to evangelize them. You see, one of my 
I don't want to say favorite verses of scripture because it's actually a very hard scripture to read. Um, one, of, one of the most convicting passages of scripture that I have, and it's actually one of our theme verses for our children's ministry, is Judges 2.10. Um, it says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. You see, this is a condemning passage. It's not one of those that makes you feel good. It says, you guys knew God. You saw what he did for Israel. You saw him lead them out of Egypt. You saw him lead them into the promised land. He, they saw the walls of Jericho fall down. But they didn't teach their kids that. They didn't teach who, the, the kids who God was or what he had done for his people. So it's a condemning passage. It's why would they not do that? And then another generation arose, and they did not know God or what he had done for Israel. Is that true for HCC? Is that true for us? Let's pray that it's not. You see, we have many opportunities to evangelize with our kids. In fact, we have one coming up uh, this summer, Vacation Bible School. Yeah. We haven't done one in a, in a few years, but this will be the first time in a while that we've done it. This will be a good opportunity to get children from the community inside the church walls, and to hear the gospel for the first time. So people in my situation, whose parents might not believe, be believers, but they're looking for daycare, or they're looking for, oh, well, it's good for them to know, know good morals, so let's send them to the church. You see, that's when we step in. That's when we evangelize to them. We tell them who Jesus is. We tell them who God is and what he has done for his people so that the next generation cannot grow up and not know who God is and what he had done for his people. You see, I think the next, I think sometimes we end there and we're like, okay, evangelize them, ask, tell them to ask Jesus into their heart, say the special prayer, and they're good. But I don't think it ends there. You see, it is also our responsibility to disciple our children. You see, sometimes we end with, oh, just say a prayer, they're good, let's dunk them in the waters and forget about it. Jesus will do the rest. But that's not where it ends in scripture. We see numerous relationships between mentor and mentoree in scripture. I think one of the uh, core ones that we see a lot is Paul and Timothy. Timothy being young, Paul being his mentor. Well, I have a passage that I want to read. It, um, it should be on the screen. It's 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Now, this is the last passage I'll, I'll turn to for you guys. It says, you then, my child. This is Paul speaking to Timothy as his child in the faith. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, it's a process. Disciples making disciples. It doesn't end with them saying a prayer, but it ends with you living life with them. Mm. With you walking along beside them and telling them who God is. Viewing them as your children. Viewing them as your own. Discipling them. Loving them. Teaching them who God is. You see, we have uh, an opportunity for this this summer with our mission trip. Uh, this summer, again, kind of a return to previous things. We have a mission trip this summer for the youth. We're going to Lakeland, Florida. It's only three and a half hours away. This is an opportunity to disciple the next generation. To say, this is what it looks like to serve God. This is what it looks like to serve God in the field. And so it's going to be a time for discipleship. It's going to be a time for them to serve. To disciple, to grow them up so that when they are old, they can raise up a next generation. So what does this look like? You see, at HCC, we have to recognize that ministry is reciprocal. That it is a process where when you minister to someone younger than you, you are also being ministered to. That it's not just a one-way street. The discipleship doesn't just happen from Paul to Timothy. But it goes both ways. You see, Timothy was also blessed by Paul, but Paul was blessed by Timothy as well. Uh, we see numerous uh, examples of other relationships. We see Moses with Joshua. We see Ruth and Naomi. We spoke about that in December. We see that with Samuel and Eli. But I think, again, Paul and Timothy are, are one of the core examples of this. It doesn't end with you pouring into them. They pour back to you. And so that's why we need to move into a family integration model of ministry. What I mean by that is there are three views of family ministry uh, within the church. We have one that 
I, I think is pretty close to what we do now. I have some objects to represent them up here because children's ministry. So it's the baby bottle. We say, let's separate them. Let's put them in their own rooms, give them sippy cups, and just leave them there. Let's, do, uh, let's have children's programs, youth programs, and do real ministry in the auditorium. You see, that's kind of what we do here. The next, uh, the next opposite extreme is a grape juice box, right? Because this isn't a wine glass. Cause, uh, but it's the opposite. It's children need to be in the service with their adults at every opportunity. They need to be there every single time the door is open. They need to be there uh, and never once get time to minister individually at their developmental stage. We see this a lot with Amish communities or with um, uh, apostles uh, of God, the apostolic of God. We see that a lot with that. You see, the problem with this is that we are entrusting children with wine glasses, grape juice boxes. We're saying, hey, you need this. A four-year-old can't drink out of this. They won't be able to. So what is the, what is the middle ground? It's a mixture of the two. You see, there needs to be an opportunity for the children to be develop, developmentally and age-appropriately taught. But they also need to be valued in the church. There also needs to be opportunities for them to see you worshiping God. They need to see that you are loving God and listening in sermons. And there needs to be an opportunity for them to serve. You see, it's got to be both. It's got to be the family integration model that's integrated together. That way, just like how if we have a men's ministry, if you're a man, you need to be in that ministry because you need people who are like you. Children need people who are like them that can speak on the level that they are at. They also need to be full members of the church. Not the wine glass, not the baby bottle, but the middle one. So that's what we're moving towards. Now, I think Pastor actually has a, an example of this. Yeah, so Chase, first of all, I want you to know that I appreciate your heart. And this man not only loves Jesus, but he loves kids, and he loves you. And, and he knows God's word, so he challenges me on a regular basis. But the idea is we begin to pull this to a close. I don't want you to think this is just a wasted service today where we came in and they talked about children's ministry. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is for us to understand that it is all of our responsibility to evangelize and disciple the next generation. You might sit here today and say, Brian, I already did that. When I was younger, I worked in children's ministry. I don't want to do that anymore. And we're not asking you to give that up. But we're asking you to have a heart for kids, for youth, and for young adults. And when we say that it's reciprocal, so the idea is not that you're going to pour into them. That's so very important. As I look at you, I look at people who are seasoned. You say, Brian, how do you know we're seasoned? Because I can see the seasoning in your hair right there. As I can see the seasoning in my hair, all right? You're seasoned. You, you've learned what it's like to go through trials. You've learned the importance of spending time with God. You know what it's like to have a real relationship with Jesus. Children and adults need to hear and see that from you. But let me flip that today. You need to learn from them as well. Sometimes we sit back and think, okay, it's my job to pour into them, and it is. But we don't humble ourselves and let them pour into us. I'll give you a personal example. About a year and a half ago, Vicki and I started a young adult life group. It was a stretch for us. But we thought, you know what? We have this group of young adults who, who really need someone to pour into their life. And so let's open up our house and let's invite them over. So about a year and a half ago, we started inviting college-age kids over to our... We call them kids because we're old and we're old enough to be their parents, all right? Don't be offended. So college-age young adults over at our house. So every 15 days, they come over to our house on a Sunday evening. By the way, if you're in that age group, we would love for you to participate with us. Shameless plug. What's that? Shameless plug. There you go, shameless plug. So here's what Brian thought when we did that, okay? These kids need to hear from me. I'm their pastor, they need to know who their pastor is. 
And with all of my wisdom and all of my knowledge, I need to take all of my knowledge and I need to pour it into them. Because if I teach them everything that I know, then they're going to grow and be these great giants of the faith. So we've been able to do that to a certain degree. A certain degree we've been able to pour into them. They come every other Sunday night. Vicki feeds them. We have a Bible study. We spend time in God's Word. We pray together. And then they go off and play games for about two hours while I sit in a chair and rest and listen to them. But here's one thing I did not realize when we started this a year and a half ago. I knew that I could pour into their lives, but I had no idea what they would teach me. And when I share with you today that youth and children's ministry is reciprocal, I mean that not only do you have the opportunity to pour into them, but they have the opportunity to pour into you. You say, Brian, what have they taught you? Well, they've taught me, first of all, that you don't have to be an old person to love and have a passion for Jesus. And I love the passion that these young adults have for Jesus Christ. As I mentioned, three of them this weekend are up in uh, uh, Grafton, Wisconsin. Right now, they're leading worship at Cedar Creek Community Church. I love that. Here's what also I've learned that I don't know everything. Even though I have the degrees and I have the experience and I'm the Bible teacher, these young adults have taught me so much as we sit and open up God's Word and we learn together. I thought I would be teaching them, but God knows how much they have taught me. And here's what else I've also learned that the future is in good hands. It's in good hands. Because it's God who builds the church. And it's God who raises up the next generation. And I'm encouraged by what God is doing here at Hollywood Community Church. So here's my challenge for you this morning. You say this has been a unique service. It has in a lot of ways. And I get that. Next week, we'll be a little bit back to normal. Dr. Bob Barnes is going to be with us next week, and you're going to want to hear Dr. Barnes. But here's what I want you to catch today. It is all of our responsibility to evangelize and disciple the next generation. You might say, Brian, already raised my kids. Doesn't matter. It's your job. You might sit back and say, I don't have any kids. It doesn't matter. It's your job. And when we will sit back as a church and realize that God can begin to do a work in our midst. I'm sure when you saw the title today, Becoming a Multi-Generational Church, your thought might have been, well, maybe he's going to talk about contemporizing our music or he's going to talk about doing this or that. And I'm going to be honest with you, reaching the next generation has little to do with music. It has little to do with any of those things, but it has everything to do with us being consistent with them, loving them, caring for them, and pointing them to Jesus Christ. And when we do that as a church, when you and I realize that that is our responsibility, it's not Chase's responsibility who's the next gen director, or it's not the children's ministry workers whose job it is. It is our responsibility to do that. And when we realize that, and we begin to put that in practice, then God can really accomplish something in our midst. So I want to end in a unique way today. Vicky's going to come and going to lead us in just a great worship song. But here's the way I want to stand. I want us to end in prayer today. Wait, here's what I want us to do. I want us to end in what I would classify as multi-generational prayer. You say, Brian, what does that mean? I would love for moms and dads to just come at an altar and spend some time with their kids at an altar. You know why I asked to do that? Because I want this to be a place that they're comfortable being. I want praying in church to be something that kids are comfortable doing. I want hearing mom and dad pray something that kids are comfortable doing. 
So as Vicki leads us in worship in just a few moments, I'm going to ask families from all over. You can just gather there. If you want to come with your kids at an altar and pray, I would encourage you to do that. But, but I want to encourage more than that. You might sit here today and say, I don't have any kids with me, so this doesn't apply to me. It does. I'd like to challenge you to find someone who is not from your generation. Somebody from a different generation. And spend a moment and pray with them. Would you do that? You say, Brian, that's going to stretch me a bit. I know it is. I know it is. We want to stretch you today. Because that's the type of church that we want to be. We want the younger generation learning from us. And we want us, me, the older generation, learning from the young. So I'd encourage you to stand. There's no obligation in this. But I really want us to learn to pray together. Would you find somebody and pray with today? And let's pray together. And let's ask God to do a work in our midst that only he can do. Obviously, you're here today, and if you'd say, Brian, I'm not a believer, I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ, we'd invite you to come. Some of our our deacons and elders will be right down front, and they'd love nothing more than to pray with you. And I'd encourage you, if you want to, to just grab them and pray with them. We can be a blessing to you. We want to do that. But let's give ourselves to God afresh and anew as a church who has a passion to reach multi-generations for the gospel. Lord, thank you for the fact that I came to Jesus as a six-year-old boy. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that there were older people who invested in my life. Help us as a church to have that burden. Help us to have a burden, Lord, to have the heart that you have. Help us to love kids, to love youth, to love young adults. Help us to love them and point them to Jesus. May that be our burden. May that be our passion. May that be our calling. Help us to do it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.